This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I can have what it says I can have. Today, I'm ready to receive the incorruptible, ever-living seed of the Word of God. Come, Holy Spirit, have your way in this place. Come, Holy Spirit, have your way in my life. I'll never be the same again. Come on. Never, never, never. In Jesus' name, amen. Best shout ever. High five somebody on the way down. Hallelujah. Praise God. All right. High five me. <laughs> I believe when you come to church, you ought to, you ought to leave better than you came. How many can agree with that? God ought to do something. I believe we're a place where you can come and be encouraged and be taught and grow up and, and be what God wants you to be. But I also be, uh, believe in that church is kind of like a hospital. I believe when we come to church, we ought to be able to get healed and get delivered and get set free by the power of God. So before I begin to minister, I'm just going to believe God. If you're here and you're hurting in your body, then God's going to touch you this morning. And what I want you to do is I want you to let God know you're a candidate. You know, I don't know if you've ever taught kids, but if you ever said to kids, uh, uh, how many of you would like to uh, have this bicycle? I mean, the people that really want it, I mean, they're out, oh, that's me. <laughs> well, uh, why don't you let God know you're a candidate? Would you do that? Just raise your hand while I pray. Father, in Jesus' name, you see the hands raised. I ask you to touch every person in this building. Don't let one person leave untouched by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Well, turn your Bible, if you would, to Romans chapter 13, beginning with verse 7, says this. Render, therefore, to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom is due, fear to whom fear is due, honor to whom honor is due, Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he that loveth another has fulfilled the law. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it's briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Father, we honor the word of God today, and we ask you to have your way in this service. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, June and I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit in 1969, and uh, both of us, we were hungry. We wanted more of God, and so we were in a convention in Chicago, Illinois, Full Gospel Ministries Convention, and uh, the Bible teacher in that convention taught on God's got a plan for your life. A wonderful plan. God wants you to know that your life has been planned out and it's good. And he thought along that line and then he made this statement that got our attention. He said, it is possible to live down here on this earth and God have a call on your life, a wonderful plan for your life, and you never fulfill it. And that really gripped my heart. I thought I would hate to go through life Go to heaven and find out that I missed it. Wouldn't you hate to do that? I, I just wouldn't want to miss what God has for me. What do you have for my life that I want to fulfill while I'm down here on this earth? So we go back home. June and I was talking about it. And I said, well, uh, if there's one thing I'm going to try to do in my life is I'm going to try to find out what does God want me to do? What is God's plan for my life? And to the best of my ability, I'm going to try to fulfill it. And so June said, got in agreement with it. We started kind of searching the Bible. And one day I was reading the Bible and I found a scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2, that says this. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. And I caught a hold of that word required. Moreover, it is required in steward. Now, all of us are stewards. All of us have gifts. All of us have talents. All of us have been given things that we're to look after. That's what a steward is. So, uh, moreover, it is required in steward that a man be found faithful, trustworthy, dependable. And 
the word required began to stir around on me and I saw required means there's no plan B. This is it. There's no other way to go. Now, I went to college after I got out of the Navy. I was, went to college on the GI Bill at the University of Alabama. And the only reason I went to college is to get out. I didn't go to play. I didn't go to, I just wanted to get out of college and go on with life. And I found out if you wanted to, you can go through college in three years. All you have to do is go through summer school. But the big challenge is you have to plan your schedule because certain courses are only taught in certain semesters. So I worked it all out. I got a catalog. I'm going to get through in three years. Had it all planned out. Everything's going according to plan to get down to the last semester. And it was a summer school semester. And I get called into the dean's office and they said, Mr. Evans, we noticed by your transcript that you did not take geography. And I said, well, I know I didn't take geography. I was in the Navy. I saw the geography I wanted to see. So I didn't take geography. And they said, but Mr. Evans, geography is required. Well, I, I, I said, well, I just, I took this. This is more appropriate to what I want. And so I took this instead of geography. But you don't understand. Geography is required. And you know, it didn't matter how long I argued. It didn't matter what I said. Geography is required. So I had to go back. I'd been, I'd been about two weeks. And if you've ever been to summer school, you know two weeks is a long time in summer school. So I had to go back and get caught up and take geography. Otherwise, I'd be an 80-year-old man at the University of Alabama trying to graduate because geography is required. Now, if the Bible says faithfulness is required, guess what? It is required. Being dependable and trustworthy is required. Now, there are three areas where we have to prove our faithfulness found in Luke chapter 16, verse 10 through 12. In those scriptures, it says you have to be faithful in little things before God gives you bigger things. You have to be faithful with your material things, your money, before God will trust you with spiritual things. And you have to be faithful in that which is another man's before God will give you that which is your own. Now, I've done a lot of teaching on faithfulness because it changed my life. There's no other scriptural principle in my life that's been more productive than understanding how important faithfulness is. So I've decided as a Christian, new Christian, baptized in the Holy Spirit back in 1971, 72, whatever it was, I'm going to be found faithful. And so I started working on being faithful in little things, being faithful with my natural talents, whatever God had gifted me with, being faithful with my money, being faithful in that which is another man's working on that. But what I want to center in on today is, is, is actually being faithful with your material things and your money. Because what I have found in this generation is we've got a group of people in this generation that is really bound up in debt and they don't know how to get out. Debt is an enemy to the plan of God. Debt is something that will put you in bondage and you cannot do what you feel like God wants you to do. And we don't understand it because debt has become so easy that it's, uh, it's easy for us to get entrapped in debt and never understand this debt is, is the devil hindering me from fulfilling the call of God on my life. So what I want to share with you that today is, is the problem that we're having with debt in, a, in our life as a Christian. Now, I'm not talking about just, you know, you go, you borrow money, you charge something on the credit card. The scripture that we read in Romans said that, owe no man anything. Well, some people take that scripture and say, well, you can't owe anybody anything. But if you go back to the context of the scripture we read, it's talking about doing what is love and what is due. So the main, main context of the scripture is walk in love, live in love. And whatever is due, that's where we're supposed to operate in love. For instance, if you, bought, if you sell me an automobile, and I say to you, I'll give you $200 a month for that automobile, I 
have obligated by love to give you $200 a month. And as long as I stay within that, I am walking in love. And this is what the scripture wants out of me. So we're not talking about that you went to, you charged something on your credit card or you did something, you got a loan at a bank. And, and as long as you're paying what's due and it's not putting you in bondage, we're not talking about that kind of debt. I'm talking about the debt that puts you in bondage where you can't do what you feel like God's telling you to do. You can't be obedient to God if he wants you to go somewhere, do something. Uh, you know, you're just bound in debt. Now that's bondage. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. But the bondage of debt. And I want to give you some instruction and we don't have a lot of time, but I've got all of this information on, on some paper that I'm going to give you at the end of the service. So you don't have to break your neck to try to write down everything I'm saying. But listen to what I'm saying because I'm trying to help you. I want to help you. I want you to get a, I want you to be able to get out of debt so that you can enjoy serving God and being a Christian and being effective. And debt is going to keep you from doing that. So you have to know that there must be something that I can do. Now, we, we then come to the point, well, how did I get in debt? Well, you get in debt because of a lot of reasons, but I'm going to, I'm going to mention a few things that I believe is very important. The first thing is, and I, I know this is just, you know, like ABC. We don't trust God. I'm, I put myself in that. I don't trust God like I ought to. You don't trust God like you ought to. We would rather trust me than trust God. See, because I can see me. I can, you know, I can understand. I can do this. I can do that. I can do something that needs to be done. But God, you know, God's up there busy. What's, you know, I don't know what God's doing. You know, that's kind of, we don't say that out loud, but we just live like we believe that. But there's a scripture in Jeremiah that says this. Verse, chapter 17, verse 5. Now listen to it. Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and that makes flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. For he shall be like the heath in the desert, and shall not see when good cometh, but shall inherit the parched places in the wilderness, in a salt land, and not inhabited. That, doesn't that sound bad? Yeah. Trusting in you will get you nowhere. Trusting in what you can do will bring you to a dead end. Because you don't know how to live supernaturally in yourself. And the only way you can be effective for God is to get out of the flesh and live supernaturally. Otherwise, you're just going to be like the rest of the population, and you're going to be down here trying to do what you're going to do, and when you start trusting in you, the best you can do is wind up in a parked place where there's no, you know, there's no water and there's no crops being produced. But it goes on to say, Blessed is the man that trusts in the Lord, for he'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. His roots will spread out, and he'll bring forth fruit in his season and won't even see when heat comes. Hallelujah. Doesn't that sound better? Amen. Trust in the Lord. So a lot of people don't trust in the Lord. You know, and we've all been guilty. We'd rather trust in ourselves and trust in God. And then the second thing is we and I put myself, I'm not I'm not preaching at you. I'm trying to get you to see that I've been through this. But we live by the flesh instead of by the spirit. And when you live in the flesh, you're trying to fulfill a God vacuum in you that cannot be filled with anything but God. See, when God created man, he created us with a God vacuum on the inside of us. The very core of us is where God designed a place for him to live by the Holy Spirit. Now, if we're living in the flesh, we're trying to fill that God vacuum with something that we think will bring us pleasure in life. And we try all kinds of things. We try money, we try cars, we try clothes, whatever it is we're looking after. But once you get it, 
you find out it really didn't work. You know, you buy a new car and you say, this is the, this is the very thing that's going to make me happy. But in three weeks, it's that old thing. You know, it doesn't bring you satisfaction. The richest man that ever lived was Solomon. He had everything. If you want to read about it, read about it in Ecclesiastes. He said, I've tried everything. I've tried getting me singers, and I've tried money, and I've tried buildings, and I've tried all of these things. And he said, it's all vanity. Nothing has made me happy. I've just gone through life. Everything I wanted, I got. And it didn't do the work on me. It didn't make me happy. The richest person in the world couldn't get happy with things. Well, you're not going to get happy with your things. You may think you will. You may think it'll bring you some happiness, but it doesn't. You need God. And you need to learn how to live by the Spirit of God, not by living by your flesh. So live trusting in God and live, thank God, with God at the center of everything you're going to do. It says this in Galatians 5, verse 16, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So we have to learn to walk in the Spirit. The next one is circumstances of life will get you in trouble. Jesus made this statement in John chapter 16, verse 33. He says, These things have I spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. Now, life can throw things on you that make you want to throw your hands up and give up. Because life happens. One day you're just walking along minding your own business, and the next thing you know you're laying in the driveway with a broke ankle. It costs money. You know, little things can happen. What are you going to do? Don't throw your hands up. Don't give up. God's still on the throne. And God has already said, there is no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape. You need to say to yourself, laying on that driveway with your ankle broke, God's got a way for me to get out of this. God's going to make a way for me to come forth in victory. I know that I'm in debt right now, but God has a way for me to escape. See, you've got to Put some emphasis on the important thing in your life is God. And God has a way for you to get out. Circumstances can come, but they cannot defeat you. God can help you get out. And then there are, th there are people that just do foolish things. I know when we were at the tabernacle back in Gadsden, Alabama, we had this friend of ours, had a good job, making good money. Things were going well for him. And he had a, another guy in the church. He was a good, you know, he's a good guy. People like him. But he just never could keep a job. Things weren't going well for him. And he had a bright idea. He was going to buy a semi-truck and become a trucker. Well, it cost back then over $100,000 to buy an 18-wheeler. And he couldn't get finances to do it. But this guy, you know, he, he sidled up to him and got him to sign the note. Well, the guy started trucking and didn't like what he was doing, so he just threw his hands up and quit and left this trusting good guy holding the bag. Because the banker's not going to go after the man that has no money. The banker's going to go after the man that has some money. And he did. It didn't almost destroy his life. That was foolish. The Bible says don't ever go and vote for anybody unless you're willing to lose it. If you're willing to give it away, go ahead and do it. But if you want to get your money out, don't do it. Because there's a pretty good chance you can get stuck on situations like that. And that's foolish. And there's a lot of things that are foolish. Uh, I, I can step on toes right now because consolidating credit cards is foolish. You know, you think, man, here's a no interest credit card. I'll just consolidate on this one. But all the credit card's doing is getting you to dig a deeper hole. You're digging the grave that's going to bury you because credit card sooner or later is going to rise up and bite you in the behind. <laughs> and you've got to face that. If you're not going to be foolish, you've got to understand that this is a trap and 
foolishness is buying on impulse. Just going out, you know, well, I, I really do like this. I know one time, this is a, a true story. Most of all my stories are true. I don't lie. I'm telling a true story. I was, this is when we lived in Gadsden, Alabama. I was walking through Sears Roebuck. I looked over there and I saw a canoe. I thought, I've always wanted a canoe. I walked around and patted on it, you know, and looked at it. And, and uh, I thought, well, it just cost, I think, $150. I think I'll get me a canoe. I walked out of Sears Roebuck with a canoe. I had no more business to have buying a canoe. <laughs> Then one close to water, took an act of Congress to get it on your car and take it to water, and I put it in the garage and it stayed there. No matter how many years. We may put it in the water a couple of times. That's foolish. Don't buy out of foolish impulses. It'll get you in debt. And uh, the next thing that'll get you in debt is trying to live like you're rich when you're not. Trying to hurry up and get rich. Here's something God knows that most people don't know. People that get wealth quick without working for it very seldom turn out good. Because riches not handled right will destroy you, not bless you. Therefore, God knows that what I work for and labor for and believe for and pray for and hold on to will be a blessing to me. But whatever just floats in will float out. And it won't be a blessing to you. And it can cause you many times to stumble and not be where you're supposed to be. So you don't want uh, you don't want to go through life thinking, well, my ship's about to come in. Your ship's going to come out, come in when you go out. And you do something about your ship coming in. Your ship's not going to dock on your doorstep while you lay in the bed and sip beer. Your ship's going to come in when you're out there putting some elbow grease into making it come in. It'll start coming in. And then God, once he sees that you know what the principles are, God begins to open the windows of heaven and pour blessings out upon you because he says they can handle it. They know what, it won't destroy them now because they know the value of working and making money. Yeah. The value of putting some effort into it. Now, that's a few things that'll, that'll work against you trying to put you in debt. Now, I want to spend the rest of the time, and I won't be, won't be able to give you a, a whole lot, but I, I'll give you enough that'll help you. If you're in bondage, now, I don't mean you just owe, owe a little money. I'm talking about if you're in bondage to debt, I want to tell you how to get out. Now, the reason that I can tell you how to get out is in, it was about 1970, I think 76, 77, somewhere in there. It was right before I went full-time in the ministry. The Lord spoke to me. And, you know, I was, I was just kind of minding my own business, but the Lord spoke to me in my spirit and said, I want you to get out of debt. Now, before then, I'd never given any thought of getting out of debt. In fact, my thought was the more you can borrow, the better you live, you know. You just borrow, borrow, borrow. And I, I was paying my bills. I wasn't behind on any bills. I was paying everybody. But it was like everything I got had to go out to pay bills. You know, just living from paycheck to paycheck. That's not God's way to live. God's way to live is to live in abundance. But you can't get there on your plan. You have to get there on God's plan. So I thought, well, how am I going to get out of debt? Because literally when God spoke that to me, I had a legal pad. When I wrote them down, a legal pad of people that are old. And I thought, this is impossible. But here's good news. God specializes in impossible situations. You know, we think there's no way to get there. There's no way to get there. And we, we think it's impossible. But I want you to know something. 
those things that are impossible with men are not impossible with God. And so God said, I want you to get out of that. And I said, well, okay, I'm just going to be obedient. We're going to get out of that. And the Lord began to show me some things to do that helped me get out of that. I'm going to share them with you. This is not theory. This is not even just a, a teaching from the Bible. This is on the job training of how God got me out of debt when I owed everybody. God got me out of debt. Now, a few rules. You'll never get out of debt if you're not willing to put some effort into it. Listen to, listen to a good scripture. Luke chapter 16, verse 16. It says, The law and the prophet were, were until John. And since that time, the kingdom of God is preached and every man presses his way into it. The kingdom of God and the blessings of God do not fall on you. You press into God. You press into the things of God. You push your way, believing the Bible. When everything contrary is saying it won't work, you bow your back and say it will work, and I'm going to do it until it happens in my life. I'm not going to let the devil rob me and live down here on skid row when I ought to be living up here on a higher level. I'm going to push my way into it press into it. And then, you know, just elementary things. Be sure if you're going to get out of debt God's way, be sure you are a tither and a giver because that is God's insurance plan. You know, the Bible, you know, just something that's probably don't need to say, but the Bible says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse. Prove me now here with saith the Lord of hosts. See if I won't open the windows of heaven. Pour blessings out upon you that there shall not be room to receive it. And God said, I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. That's a pretty good insurance plan. I mean, you can't, you cannot get a job with any company. I don't care how big they are. I don't care how high they are on the food chain. There's no business going to hire you and say, if you work here, you'll never like any good thing. I'll just open the whole business up. Anything you need, I'll heap it on you, and I'll guarantee you that you won't get sick and you won't, you won't, uh, uh, you know. He'll rebuke the devourer. Did you know every sickness and disease and curse that's known to man comes from the devil, not from God? And God said, I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. Well, if you're trying to live in the supernatural, you want to be sure you're doing it God's way, not your way. And God said, give, and it'll be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. God said in the Bible, if you scatter, that means throw it out, it'll increase. If you hold on to more than you ought to, it will tend to poverty. So you could have a room full of money and hold on to it and wind up poor. You can have nothing and give it away and wind up rich. That's just thrown in there. It didn't cost you anything extra. I mean, I just had to throw, I just wanted to be sure you had your insurance plan before you tried to have supernatural help from God. If you want to get supernatural help, you have to do it God's way. And so I have, if you're doing things God wants you to do, then you're on good territory. Now here's starting how to get out of debt. God says this. He said if you're going to get out of debt, you have to make a decision to stop charging. Doesn't that, that sound simple? You have to make a decision to stop charging and to keep paying. Now, that sounds easy when you say it. But if your charges are taking all your money to pay the charges, how are you going to live? Doesn't that make sense? All right. 
I'm going to tell you how you do it. But first of all, I want to tell you that in order for me to make that decision, God said, you're going to have to go to June and get her on board because there's power in agreement. If two of you on earth shall agree as touching anything they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father in heaven. So I've got to get on her own, you've got to get her on board. This is what God was ministering to me. You've got to get her on board. Because otherwise, if I march into her and say, okay, cut up all your credit cards, no more charging, I have thrown strife into my marriage. And the Bible says where there's anything in strife, there's confusion and every evil work. So therefore, we had to be in agreement. And I talked to her, so to what God said, and she got on board. She said, okay. And she said, how are we going to live? Uh, well, that's what I was saying. How are we going to live? If you're, if you're going to pay and not charge, how are you going to live? Because everything we've got is going out to pay the bills. Well, I, I want you to know that what, I, what God showed me was if you're going to, if you're going to keep paying and quit charging, you have to know that God is going to do some supernatural things to help you. And when you, when you know that, then, and I'll just, just give you a couple of scriptures, but this is what the, the scriptures the Lord gave me. Romans chapter 8, verse 32. He that spared not his own son, but freely gave him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Folks, that's either true or it's a lie. There's no other third choice. That's either true or it's a lie. How much more will God freely give us all things? And I've chosen to believe it's the truth. Because God can't lie. And that's in the Word of God. And then listen to 2 Peter. Chapter 1, verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as His divine power, according as His divine power, talking about God, has, past tense, given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Ah, uh, no, you don't believe that, do you? Well, it's in the Bible. Jesus Christ died that you could have all things. That you could trust Him for all things that you need in life. To live an abundant, overcoming, victorious life has given us all things through Him. Through the knowledge of Him that has called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through us. God said, I've already made provision for you to live without doing all the charging you're doing. What I want out of you, this is what God was speaking to me, and I'm telling you what God told me. God said, what I want you to do is to believe me that I'll do what I said I'll do. That's all I want you to do is believe I'll do what I said I'll do. And so we started on our journey, and we started walking and dying. Well, do not think you'll start this journey, and the devil will go down the lie down and play dead. The devil has come to kill, to steal, and to destroy. So we hadn't, we, you know, we hadn't been doing this, but just, uh, uh, you know, just start, really started it. And I think it was our dishwasher tore up. Well, you know, you can live without a dishwasher, but and, and what, and I was talking to him about it. And it wasn't as easy for her to live without it as it was for me. And then I said, well, let's believe God to give us a dishwasher. And so, lo and behold, if somebody didn't give us money for a dishwasher, 
And then a garbage disposal tore up. We've had to, uh, you know, my first thought is, well, just go to Sears Roebuck, put it on the easy payment plan. No, we're not charging. If we can't get it by faith, we won't have it. See, that's, that's the decision we made. If we can't get it by faith, we won't have it. And so we got a garbage disposal. Now the, the, the thing that almost sunk the boat. I did a, my tax return and being a CPA at the time, this was on, I think I finished my tax return on April 15th. And got through with it and owed $4,000. Looked in my bank and I think I had $100 in the bank. I said, oh my goodness, $4,000. I reached over, picked the phone up. I was going to call the banker because I knew I could call him and he'd put $4,000 in the checking account. I started to dial the number and I heard the Lord say, I thought you weren't going to borrow any money. It kind of took me back and I sat down. I, I said, well, we did say that. But I didn't mean $4,000. <laughs> and I thought, well, no, we made that decision. I said, well, well I don't have $4,000. Well, being a CPA, I knew I could mail my tax return in without the money and they had billed me without a penalty. So I mailed my tax return in about two months later or however long it took. I got a notice back and they said, you owe us $7,000. I thought, dear God, this is getting worse by the minute. <laughs> but I went back and found out they had made a mistake and only owed them $4,000. So I wrote them back and I said, no, I do not owe you $7,000. I only owe you $4,000. And I showed them where they had made a mistake. And so a couple of months, you know, a month or two later, I get another letter back. You're right. You only owe us $4,000. Please remit. <laughs> But I, I went to my bank to see where we were, and I had more than four thousand dollars in it. I really don't know how I got there. Supernatural. I'm telling you, I know it blows your mind, but God is a supernatural God, able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we could ask or think. And so. We, we started living without charging. Now, it took a while. It didn't happen overnight. But I'm glad to report to you the time came when we did not owe anybody anything except we had to, to think soberly. And this is a, the next thing on, on my list that I want to share with you. There are things that you have to decide, well, like, I needed a car to be in business. And I, could, I didn't have the faith to believe God for a car. And I knew I didn't have faith to believe God for a car, so I, I thought, well, and here's what God showed me. Debt bondage is not if you buy something that has value and it retains its value while you pay it off. That's not bondage. Because if you had to, you could sell your automobile and get out of debt. You follow that principle? And then the same thing is true with a, with a house. You know, I didn't want to just uh, give up all my equity in the house because I owed on the home, but my house was worth more than I owed on it. So if I had to get out of debt, I could sell my house and get out of debt. So I wasn't in bondage. Do you follow what I'm talking about? Bondage is where you can't pay it, and it's, there's no way to pay it. That's the bondage that we're talking about. So you have to think soberly. Most of the things that we get in trouble with is where you buy it and it has no value. Did you know if you go into a department store and you pay $500 for a dress and take it home and put it on, it's worth about 20 Did you know that? The best you can do is go to Goodwill and they might give you $5 for it. But it's not worth anything to pay it off. If you've charged that, you're in bondage. You're charging things that have no value now, except to you, you know, to look pretty in. And sometimes it's better to not owe and look ugly. Amen. But we have to see God is our source. God's my source. God's going to help me. 
God's going to show me how to get out of debt and stay out of debt. And when you start believing that, supernatural things start happening. I mean, it's amazing. June would come in and she'd say, look what I found. And she said, I, I only paid $5 for this. And I said, where'd you buy that? And she bought it from a department store. And I thought, that's worth $50. You just paid $5 for it? Yes. How did you do that? Well, she says, I guess my angel's out there looking after me. <laughs> he found this dress, thought I'd like it, and hid it so nobody else could see it. <laughs> I don't know if that's true. She might have been making that up. But, you know, God knows how to do things we don't know how to do. Her, her daddy. Anybody in here ever watch Archie Bunker back when Archie Bunker was... June's dad was Archie Bunker on steroids. <laughs> he bought a television from Sears Roebuck. And it was a new one, a big screen television. Not like today's big screen, but I mean a big television with a screen. <laughs> with a screen. And he said, there's a line in this picture. And I looked at it, I said, I don't see a line. He said, there it is, right there. And he called Sears Roebuck, and they sent out a guy and looked at it, and he couldn't see the line. He said, there's a line going right across the screen. I see it. And they didn't do anything about it. So he, he wrote, Archie Monkey, he wrote the head guy of Sears Roebuck, wherever they are. I don't know where they are, <laughs> Chicago. He wrote the head man. said, I bought this old television, and it's not working, got a line in it. And I want to complain. Well, a few days later, he gets a visit from the manager of Sears Roebuck. He said, Mr. Cap, don't ever do that again. Said, Here, we brought you a brand new television. And just keep that old television with a line in it. And we give you this brand new one. And he gave us the television with a line in it. Because our television was broken. And we didn't have connection with Sears Roebuck that he had. <laughs> and he gave us that old television with a line in it. We kept it for years. Never saw the line. And finally, finally, when we got some money to buy a television, we gave it. We, I was pastoring in Statesboro at that time. We'd moved from Gadsden to Statesboro. It was still working years later. And we gave it to the children's department. And the last I heard, that thing was still going. God knows how to do things we don't know how to do. He's a supernatural God. So you have to give God a chance to work. God's your source. Don't ever think that business where you work is your source. They are a provider that God is using to funnel some funds to you. But they are not your source. God is your source. I was teaching this in, in back in Gadsden back in the 70s. I was teaching it in the tabernacle where I was just a lay person there, but I was teaching Sunday school. And I started hammering on, God's your source. God's your source. And then I made this statement. I said if Goodyear, because most people, you know, worked at Goodyear, made good money, and had good retirement plans, good medical plans. I said if Goodyear goes on strike tomorrow, I don't want you to worry because Goodyear's not your source. God's your source. And sure enough, about a month later, Goodyear went on the longest strike they'd ever been on. I don't know if I was prophesying or what. But after the strike was over, this guy stood up in church and said, I want to give a testimony. He said, I worked at Goodyear, and we went out on this strike, been out longer than we'd ever been out on the strike before. And he said, I remembered what Brother Gene said that Goodyear was not my source. God was my source. He said, my wife and I joined hand and prayed and said, just like Brother Gene said, we agree that God is going to take care of you, take care of us during this strike, and we're going to live better trusting God than we did when we trust Goodyear. And he said, I want to report to you, um, we live better. We live better than when we were trusting in good year. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad God's bigger than good year? Better than good year. 
and he can do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think. So expect God to do supernatural things. I'll, I'll try to end with this one, but learn to be content. Did you know you don't have to have everything you think you have to have? If you're a young married person, don't try to live in the same category your mom and dad live in. Try to trust God, believe you'll move up a little bit, a little bit here, a little bit there. And without going in debt, God will take care of you and you'll live better trusting God than you did if you thought you could go out and charge everything and live on a higher level than you were not equipped to pay for and get in trouble. So don't try to do that. So here's what I've done. June, I've got some papers here with an outline of basically what I taught here. But I've got the scriptures and I've got everything. If you're serious about getting out of debt, I'm going to have her, June, put these up here on the table. And after the service is over, if you, if you want to pick up one, one of them is what gets you in debt. The other one is how to get out of debt, how to get out of the bondage of debt. Pick up those papers and I'll pray for you and believe God will help you to get out of debt if that's you. Okay? Is that all right with you? If God would get you out of debt and help you get on a good footing. So those will be up here laying on the communion table after the service is over. Uh, you pick one up and I'm going to lay hands on it and we're going to agree God's going to get you out of debt. You're going to be out of the bondage of debt. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's a good place to be. Amen. I can testify. How many know if you didn't have to pay a car, you didn't have to pay your house payment, you didn't have to pay all those clothing bills, if you didn't have any credit card debt, that you'd be living a lot better today. Maybe you wouldn't, but I believe you would. Hallelujah.